as the choir is coming down, I'll go ahead and give you our focal passage for this morning, because I know it's not listed in your bulletin, that's because I didn't have it until about 2 o'clock this morning. Uh, I, I knew where God was leading us, but just didn't know which set of verses that uh, he was actually going to pull out for focal for us this morning. But uh, if you would, just turn to Second Chronicles uh, chapter 25, and then whenever you have your place there, just hold your finger there and, and turn over to James chapter 4. In this, 2 Chronicles chapter 25 and James chapter 4. Now over the, the past couple of weeks, our pastor has kind of been leading us uh, through a series entitled Proper Preparation Leads to Divine Dividends. Uh, and today we're going to kind of keep along that same topic, uh, but kind of hit it just from a little different ang angle this morning, uh, and kind of look at how our attitude leads us to the actions that we take. Uh, Charles Swindoll once said this, said, we cannot change our past, we cannot change the fact that people will act a, in a certain way, we cannot change the inevitable, the only thing we can do is play on the one string that we have, and that is our attitude. Charles went on to say that he was convinced that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. And that is you and I this morning. Uh, you know, we are in charge of our attitudes. We can't help the, the small percentage of things that happens in our life, but as, as we take and we look at our attitude, we can react to that in a good way or in a bad way. Other than our faith in Jesus Christ, our attitude is probably the most significant aspect of our life in determining our happiness, influence, and our effectiveness. Now, Andy Cook, in his, his book, A Power Beyond Belief, the continuing word of the Holy Spirit in the 21st century, uh, wrote about this here, young man um, that, that just had an incredible attitude. And the guy's name was Michael, and he says that Michael had a fantastic attitude. When someone asked him how he was doing, he'd always reply, if I'd be any better, I'd be twins. Now, he was just a natural motivator. If an employee was having a, a bad day at, at work, I, he was always telling them to look at something positive that was either uh, going to come out of that or that was happening through that. He was always having them to look at the positive side of the situation that they were in. And so, someone once asked him, said, I just don't get it, Michael. I mean, how is it that you can just be positive all, all the time? And Michael replied back to him. He said each and every morning whenever he wakes up, he has two choices that he can choose. He can either choose to have a good attitude or either he can choose to have a bad attitude. Each time that something bad happens, he can choose to be a victim or either he can choose to learn from it. And Michael simply said that he chose to learn from it. Every time someone comes up to him complaining, he'd always point out the positive side of life. Michael's positive attitude was put to the test one day when he fell off of a 60-foot one, a 61-foot tall tower. Michael endured months of surgeries and weeks of intensive care, and whenever he was finally free to go home, he was released with only rods in his back. Six months after that happened, someone asked Michael, said, Michael, how are you? And his reply was, if I'd be any better, I'd be twins. Do you want to see my scars? No, Michael went on to tell a little bit more about the things that had happened after he had taken that fall. You know, he, immediately after the fall, the first thing that went through his mind was the well-being of his soon-to-be-born 
daughter. Now, as he laid on the ground, he remembered he had two choices. Either he could live or he could choose to die. Michael chose to live. Regardless of Michael's attitude, however, he was in a very serious condition. Michael continued that the paramedics were great. They kept telling, telling him that he was going to be fine, but when they wheeled him into the ER, he could see the expression on the doctors and nurses that this was a dead man. Michael knew right then that he needed to take action. And they asked him, they said, well, Michael, what did you do? He said, well, there was this big burly nurse asking questions at him, and she asked if he was allergic to anything. And he said, yes. And at that moment, everything took a dead silence for them waiting to tell them what it was. What was it? Michael just took and gave a big old smile and yelled, Gravity! the whole ER erupted in laughs. You know, and, and over the roar of the laughs, Michael said, operate on me as if I'm a live man, not a dead man. Michael lived not only to the skill of the doctors, but because of his amazing attitude. Some of the physicians even called it a miracle the way that he pulled through. No, and just like Michael, our attitudes can make our life better. It can either make us be an optimistic person or either it can make us be a pessimistic person. But no matter what person you choose to be, you are in control of your ability and the ability to change it. Now, William Jones, an American psychologist and philosopher who lived in, uh, from 1842 to 1910, said this. He said, the greatest discovery of his generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. Our attitudes can and are influenced by association. Now, if you hang out with pessimistic people, then your attitude will be one of a pessimistic. If you hang out with optimistic people, then you'll have an optimistic outlook on life. Your attitude will be one of confidence and happiness. You know, as, as we, we think about our attitude and how contagious it is, it's almost like this, this jar right here. I mean, this jar is, is full of water. And, and any time we get jostled a little bit, we take and we spill whatever we're full of. If, if we're full of a bad attitude, guess what we're spilling out? We're spilling a bad attitude. But if, if whenever we're jostled and we've got a good attitude, it's being contagious to the others and their attitude will change also. If you want to have a positive attitude, then surround yourself with optimistic people. Optimistic people are magnets to draw on others that can do, or that have and can do, have an attitude and a robust nature that propels them forward. Once you condition your thinking to have a positive attitude, you will accelerate in life. I stopped short of calling it success there because in the world we get success kind of confused with God's view of what success is. If you would, just please stand with me as we read our verses this morning. 2 Chronicles verse, or chapter 25, verse 2. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. And then over in, in James chapter 4, verse 17. Psalm 
So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning, Father, we come just to allow you to work within our lives. Father, as we take and we look at your word and, and how our attitude affects everything that, that we do in life, help your word to, to give us good cheer and, and help us to be remindful of having a, a Christ-like attitude. Father, just let your word speak to us individually. Let it com just convict us where we need convicting and move us where we need moving. For it's in your holy name that we ask these things. Amen. Now, as, as the writer of, of Sacred Chronicle there tells us, and um, he tells us, that it is, is possible that we can be doing the right thing, but with the wrong attitude and motive. And James comes right along uh, behind that in our scripture there and, and tells us that it's also a sin. You know, our attitude can cause us to be committing a sin when we're actually doing the right thing. Because our, our heart isn't in the right motive of why we're doing it. Uh, in fact, some may be here today that you, you came to the worship service, but you didn't come with a heart prepared for worship. I mean, you had the right idea of coming to worship, but maybe the motive was just wrong. Come just to be seen. Maybe you wanted to come and see what these beautiful flowers look like. Maybe it was just because you had a duty to fulfill this morning. I know this one doesn't apply, you know, because they're not here. Maybe you knew the pastor wasn't going to be here. You know, they're not here because they knew he weren't here, weren't going to be here. Maybe you woke up this morning and just decided you didn't have anything else better to do. So you came to worship. Or maybe you just came because the rest of your family came. And you wanted to come along with them. See, you made a choice to be here, but no matter what the motive was, it got you here. So don't worry. If you didn't come with the right motive, there's still time for you to change the attitude as to why you showed up. See, right now, you can say that you're going to allow God for the rest of this service to speak truth and light into your life. Your attitude will decide if you will allow God to change your thinking this morning. Some showed up this morning expecting to receive that fresh word that God has for them this morning. These folks not only did what was right, but they had the right attitude and motive of showing up. What you get out of the message this morning depends on your attitude. So how does our attitude affect our life? first thing that, that I want us to see is that our attitude determines our approach on life. Uh, Steve uh, Goddard uh, wrote about a hummingbird and a vulture. And, and he said that both of them flies over our nation's deserts. And the buzzard is, is flying around and he's looking for rotting meat. All he's doing is circling until he finds that that dead animal out there, and, and once he finds it, he goes for it. The hummingbird is out there flying in the same desert, but he's looking for some colorful blossoms in the desert. See, the vulture lives on what was. They live on the past. But the hummingbird, they fill themselves with what is. They seek new life. They fill themselves with freshness and life. Each bird finds exactly what it's looking for. And we do the same thing. At times in our lives, we are the vultures uh, circling the past. We want to grip it, gripe and complain about everything that has gone wrong or why the decisions that were made were not the best decisions. 
But Isaiah tells us in verse 43, verses 18 through 19, he says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, because I am doing a new thing. Now Isaiah tells us not to hold on to the past. Today is a new day. Tomorrow will be a new day. We cannot change our past, but we can redirect our future. Now each week, in our nation, there are about 200 churches that close their doors. To do the math, that's 10,400 churches each year that closes their doors. Now, and Tom Rayner, uh, in one of his blogs, he, he writes uh, about uh, some of the things that is happening in these churches. But the one thing that uh, he kind of hones in on, on one of them is that the reason churches are closing is due to them living in the past. He said most churches are stuck in the 1970s and 1980s. Sadly, he goes on to note that a lot of these churches are small churches. They're trying to hold on to those traditions, trying to hold on to, to what was and, and go back to the, the days of their glory. So in fact, our state convention at one time was, was kind of pushing revitalization inside our churches. But they've since taken a new direction and have now started pushing new church plants. The reason why is because there is no tradition. They have to rely on God and God only to grow. There were these two men who went to the same church the same day, same service. The first man, he frowned when a member in the band missed a note on the guitar. He glared menacingly at two whispering teenagers. He looked repeatedly at his watch. When the offering plate was passed, he felt as though the usher was staring at him to see how much he would give. He sat tight-lipped during all the praise and worship songs. During the sermon, he felt pleased with himself when he caught the preacher making a slip of the tongue. And as he sneaked out of the side door during the invitation, he mumbled to himself, Why do I even bother? The second man, he chuckled at the sight of a father exchanging hugs with the toddler. During the offertory, he wondered, God has given me so much, am I giving enough? He struggled honestly with the scripture readings to find a word to live by. But part of the sermon helped him with a question he had often thought about. He enthusiastically joined in the singing of the closing song. And as he left the church, he thought to himself, how good it is to be here in the presence of God. See, both men had gone to the same church, same Sunday, and each one of them found exactly what they were looking for. While the first man came in and, and he was just looking for everything that was wrong, he found it. Folks, if we come in the church and, and to God's house and we want to find everything that is wrong with it, we can find it. But you know, if we come and we take the attitude of not I can or I should or I could, but I will. Now, I will participate. I will gladly participate. I will have a, a great attitude. I'm going to come and, and get what God has for me this morning. If that's the reason you come, you can find it. See, your attitude decides what you get out of it. Sometimes we find it hard to have a positive attitude in life. You know, it's easy to complain about the dirty dishes or the, the pile of dirty laundry that's now beginning to, to stink or either the unmade beds that the children had not made. It's so easy to look at the negative side. You know, I suppose the Israelites, after Moses was leading them out of Egypt, 
and they were, were out there uh, heading for the promised land, and this was before they got there, and, and they had to wander around another 40 years. You know, I, I wonder how many of them were, were grumbling about the food. I mean, you know, whenever you have, have tried manna soup and quail and manna casserole and, and sweet and sour manna, I mean, you know, you've had it, and you've had it for days. It's kind of hard to, to lose, I mean, it's, it's very easy to lose sight of where you've come from. I mean, there they were, they're out there grumbling. You know, telling Moses, you've not, you know, you've brought us out here to die. We don't have nothing to eat. He said, at least we'd have had food back if we'd still been in bondage. But you see, they forgot about how hard the bondage was on them. And yet, here they are, they're free, and they're complaining. Attitude affects our relationship with others. Luke 6, 31 says, And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. The golden rule, as some of us know it. How we treat others is not to be determined by how we expect them to treat us or how we want to be treated, or we are to treat them how we want to be treated. The golden rule is a willingness to take a considerable risk. No one has a guarantee to overcome the indifferences or either they can prompt a negative response that can destroy any relationship in our lives. Hebrews 10, 24 through 20. 25 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Now, we are, are to be encouragers to one another, not folks that come in and tear each other down. So, been a few days back over in, in Walmart as was walking up and down the, the grocery aisles over there, I came across this father who had this little son in the buggy as he was pushing him along and, and he was collecting his items. And, and the uh, little boy, which was a toddler, he was probably about three, maybe four years old, uh, he was kind of getting a little restless, actually very uh, uh, restless. Uh, restless. And, and so the father, as he was pushing his cart down, he was collecting his, his items, he was like, calm down, Danny. Be patient, Danny. Be patient. Stay calm, Danny. Danny, just stay calm, be patient. You know, and, and there was another lady that kind of took note of, of what was happening here also. And so she walks over to the, the father and she says, Sir, she said, I just want to commend you for the way that you're handling your son and, and how you're, you're telling your little son, Danny, to stay calm and, and, and to be patient. He said, Ma'am, my son's name's Johnny. I'm Danny. Sometimes, sometimes we have to realize that our attitude can determine the situation around us. You, you know, Danny was, was talking to himself, but in return, little Johnny was being able to kind of kind of feel the the attitude that was coming off. You know, and it's kind of like us. Us at times, you know, whenever we're at work, I mean, if, if we're always positive, then most likely the folks around us will start becoming positive. If we're negative, they're going to start becoming negative around us. We must be the one that influences the situation at hand. Our attitude also affects our perspectives. When the Israelites were facing battle against the Philistines and, and the entire Israelite army was out there and, and Goliath would come out and you know they said, hey, you send your, your best out and we're sending our best out. And ever who, ever who wins, wins the war. But as the Israelites, they stood there and they looked and they saw how big this giant was. You know, the first thing in their mind was, we can't kill 
that guy. He's too big. He's too huge. But then there comes this here little guy named David. And he comes up and, and, and Goliath steps out and he starts, you know, come on. Where are you at? And the Israelites are, are standing there again. You know, we, we, can't, we can't beat this big guy. But David looks at him and he says, you know what? This guy is so big, I can't help but to hit him. He's so large, I can't miss him. How do we look at our problems? I mean, are they so big that God can't solve them? Are they so small that we shouldn't even bother God with them? Folks, as a child of God, none of our problems are too big or too small for God. In Joshua 14, Caleb reminded Joshua of the promise that God had uh, given to him through Moses after they had spied out the promised land. Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the twelve that came back with a positive report to Moses. The other ten came back with negative reports. They said, you know, we look like grasshoppers come up against them. But Caleb and Joshua said, hey, we can go and we can take them. God's given us this land, let's go take it. But the ten had the negative attitudes that went through the rest of the, of the Israelites. And, and so, as God had promised through Moses that the land in which Caleb's foot had trodden would be an inheritance for Caleb and his family, Caleb reminded Joshua. So at the age of 85, Caleb tells Joshua, hey, I want to go and take that mountain that God has promised to me. See, Caleb had a mountain-sized attitude. While the other ten spies had the grasshopper attitude. The grasshopper attitude caused everybody to wonder an additional 40 years. Spent the rest of their life wandering in a wilderness. Don't let a doubting and insecure attitude cause you to miss God's blessings in your life. A positive attitude helps us to press forward with confidence. Have you ever continu continually prayed for something only to feel like God has never answered it? But you've made all the preparations to receive the answer from that prayer. But there were three Hebrew teenagers who, under King Kevin Nebuchadnezzar, that was called before him one day. Because the king had, had created this golden image, and he said, anytime you hear music playing, you are to bow down to this statue. But these three teens, I mean, they didn't. I mean, they, they carried on, and so they were summoned before the king. And he said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Is this true that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the golden statue? I will, and he told him, he said, I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue. Or either you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you? Well, here's the reply of those three Hebrews. In Daniel 3, 17 through 18, it says, If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See, their circumstances were either a fiery furnace or either bowing down to an idol. They had predetermined what their action would be before they ever got to this. 
And so they were able to, to use their attitude to portray, you know, you know what, king? We don't care what it is that you're going to do to us. We'll gladly take that fiery furnace because we're not going to bow down. They said, even if God doesn't spare us from it, then we know that he still values us. They pressed forward because they trusted God and knew that where exactly they were, that God intended them to be. Now, do you have total faith in God's deliverance today? If God brings you to it, then he will bring you through it. But he may not do it the way that you want him to. So we have to be careful that while God allows us to endure the trials, that we don't fall into an attitude of giving up. You know, in the, the comic strip of Cal, uh, Calvin and Hobbes, you know, there was a strip that ran one time, and, and I can't remember which one said it to the other one, but... Um, it said, God put me on earth to accomplish a certain number of things. Right now, I'm so far behind, I'll never die. Now, isn't it good to know that nothing can happen to us without God's permission? Philippians 1.23 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. God will keep us here until he's finished with us. And until then, we need to keep a positive attitude to serve him. Until then, it's too soon for us to quit or give up. Having a positive attitude also brings us joy. James 1, 2 through 3 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, that when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Think about an Olympic athlete. I mean, they sometimes just train for years and years before they ever get to compete on the big stage. And they put all this training into it. All for this one time that may not even last a full minute. But you know what? They, no matter what happens within that race, they complete it with joy. I mean, because it, it's that they know that they have accomplished what they have set out to do, and that is to compete in the biggest games that anyone could ever compete in. Now, the same could be said about our lives as, as a believer. Running the race of life as a believer is not always fun, just as it's not always fun in the training for those Olympics to get there. I mean, they have to endure pain. You know, and us as, as believers, we also endure the trials, and sometimes it can be painful to us also. But when we realize that God is our personal trainer, it is a joy to be on the winning side to know the outcome of it was well worth it. Positive attitudes also push you to take risks. In Matthew 14, Peter got out of the boat when Jesus invited him to, and the other 11 stayed back. You know, they stayed in, in the dryness and in the comfort and security of the boat because they thought that they were going to sink. Peter took a risk, and God came through for him. Sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zones and take risk in life. We need to have a go attitude in life. You know, there was a fly that was buzzing along one morning when he saw a, a lawnmower. And so he went and he landed on the handle of the lawnmower. And as he was sitting there, he was watching the kids come by to go to school. And there's this one little kid who tripped and spilled everything out of his lunchbox. And so he, he picked everything up and put his stuff back in his lunchbox and grabbed his books and everything and, and went on the way. But the fly noticed that this kid had left a piece of bologna. And he got to looking at that bologna and, and how good it would be because he hadn't eaten in a while. So this fly went and he started eating and he ate until he was so full that he couldn't fly off. And so he had to 
had to, to crawl back across the sidewalk, cross, crawl um, across the lawn, up the wheel of the lawnmower, and up the handles so that he could sit back and watch. When he got up there, he noticed that he still hadn't eaten that piece of bologna. So as he sat there, temptation got the best of him. As he took off to, to fly down to the baloney, he forgot that he was so full he couldn't fly. So he slapped, there he went. The moral of the story, don't fly off the handle if you're full of baloney. See, when we take risks, they all don't have a good outcome. But God will still use those trials in our lives to help us grow in our relationship with Him. To help mold us into the person that He wants us to be. A positive attitude also gives us opportunity. Galatians 6.10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. There was a young man that was promoted within his company. And, and so as he got this uh, position, he, he went to the older guy who uh, had kind of semi-retired, but he was still around, and, and he was asking him, you know, for some advice on how to be successful in this role. And so as he, he asked, he says, Sir, I was wondering if you could give me some, some advice on staying successful. The old man came back with just two words, right decisions. The young man had hoped for a bit, for a, a bit more than this, so he said, well, thank you. That's really helpful, and I appreciate it. But can you be just a little more specific of how do I make the right decisions? And the old man responded, experience. The young man said, well, that's just the point of my being here. I don't have the kind of experience that I need. So how do I get it? And the old man replied back, wrong decisions. Now as we think about our attitudes and how it affects every area of our life, and how they can, in effect, decide our outcomes. I want to read this unusual prayer that a lady whose name is unknown wrote. She wrote, Dear Lord, thank you for the sink of dirty dishes. We have plenty of food to eat. Thank you for this pile of dirty, stinky laundry. We have plenty of nice clothes to wear. And I would like to thank you, Lord, for those unmade beds. They are so warm and comfortable at night. Know that many have no beds. My thanks to you, Lord, for this bathroom, complete with all the splattered, messy, soggy, grimy towels and all the dirty lavatory. They are so convenient. Thank you for the finger smudge refrigerator that needs defrosting so badly. It has served us faithfully for many years. It is full of cold drinks and enough leftovers for two or three meals. Thank you, Lord, for this oven that absolutely must be cleaned today. It has baked so many good meals over the years. The whole family is grateful for this tall grass that needs mowing and the lawn that needs raking. We all enjoy the yard. Thank you, Lord, even for the slamming screen door. My kids are healthy and able to run outside and play. Lord, the presence of all these chores waiting, awaiting me says that you have richly blessed my family. I shall do them cheerfully and gratefully. Even though I can clutch my blanket and growl when the alarm rings, thank you, Lord, that I can hear. There are many who are deaf. Even though I keep my eyes closed against the morning light as long as possible, thank you, Lord, that I can see, for many are blind. Even though I huddle in my bed and put off rising, Thank you, Lord, that I have strength to rise, for there are many who are bedridden. Even though, the, even though the first hour of my day is hectic, when socks are lost, toast is burnt, and tempers are short, and my children are so loud, thank you, Lord, for my family. There are many who are lonely. Even though our breakfast table never looks 
like the picture in a magazine, and the menu is at times not balanced. Thank you, Lord, for the food we have. There are many who are hungry. Even though the routine of my job is often monotonous, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to work. There are many who have no job. Even though I grumble and bemoan my fate from day to day, I wish my circumstances were not so modest. Thank you, Lord, for the life that you have given us. And just as that lady right there, she had all the reason to have a, a, a bad outlook on life. Things weren't getting done, had too much to do, but yet, she looked at the positive side of everything. How are we? The glass half empty or half full? That's an attitude that we have to decide. Are we glad for the small things that we have? Or do we want to complain and gripe because we don't have more? What's our attitude? Does it reflect God's love? Positive attitude reflects God's nature. What about you? Do you reflect God's nature? Let's close in prayer. Father, as we come to this time of our service, Father, to make our decisions known to you. Father, we just ask that you would allow your power of choice to move among us. Father, that we don't take light the gift of attitude that you have given us. That, Father, that we give the attitude within the scope that you allow us. We thank you that you give us the power to choose our attitude. So we ask you today to help us improve our attitudes, to be more reflective of the biblical values that you give us in your word. Father, give us an attitude of faith, of boldness, passion, and love for others. Help us change, God. It's in your holy and precious name that we ask these things.